My name is Juan Charles Lavinia. I work for SAIC and I uh, host the, these forums on a monthly basis and we're very honored that you're here today um, to talk about the future. Very exciting. Uh, this community which uh, has done amazing things like put a man on the moon uh, is going to talk about the future of what can be done here in Houston so very exciting to to be part of this conversation. Um, so my job is really to introduce our, our moderator and host and moderator. So um, he is the environmental, the executive director of Environmental Institute in Houston and at U of H Clear Lake. And um, I'm just gonna turn it over to him because there's a lot to cover. And so once again, thank you for being here and please join me in a warm welcome for uh, George Gillian. Thank you. Thank you, George. Thank you, Juan. Thank, thank you, Juan. Um, I, uh, very happy to see everyone here. We're uh, very proud to sponsor this event along with our co-hosts. We have a wonderful slate of speakers. And I have to apologize if I'm going to have to read a little bit here because I want to make sure I don't forget anyone, which I'm prone to do. Um, first of all, I'd like to recognize our sponsors and individuals who made this possible. And in particular, I'd like to uh, uh, recognize Stacy Schutz, who's with the uh, JSC Sustainability Program. Uh, I like to, of course, recognize Juan uh, Trans uh, Salvina, who uh, organizes the JSC uh, Speakers Program. Uh, also, his uh, uh, colleague uh, 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 Adela uh, Cardonia. I hope I pronounced that correct. Um, and uh, also, I like to especially uh, uh, thank and recognize Doug Peterson, who's sitting over here on the side. Who this would not be possible without his, his planning and efforts. Uh, he's vice chair of the Exploration Green um, uh, Conservancy. He worked quietly and persistently behind the scenes uh, as a volunteer for the Houston Region of Concern uh, Citizens for organizing this event and selling, setting up this wonderful panel of speakers. Uh, also, I can recognize the other sponsors, the AUA, Americans United in Action, uh, the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronomics, or AIAA, and again, the Houston Region of Concerned Citizens, HRCC. Uh, I also like to uh, note and, and uh, thank Neil Lane, who's uh, uh, the, a professor of physics and astronomy at Rice University, who spent quite a bit of time helping us organize and preparing to help us today, and provided us some useful input on organizing this event. He was to serve as the moderator, but unfortunately he is ill and he could not attend. And so I wish, hope he'll get well soon, and I hope to serve as a suitable substitute. Uh, finally, I'd like to thank all the volunteers for all the organizations in the back and EIH and the UHCL who have made this event possible. Uh, there's also, uh, we have some organizations that uh, have tables in the back, and one in particular uh, is Texans Recovering Together, which is a organization trying to help folks who have had some serious problems dealing with uh, recovering from flood events. There's the physical and there's the mental and the stress associated with flooding and what it does to you. And uh, that's something that we often overlook. Um, tonight, we're going to talk about water. Uh, in this case, too much water. I've been in forums where we talk about droughts and not providing enough no water, but in this case, too much water and uh, coming too fast and in all the wrong places and what we can do about it as we move forward. Uh, we've all been touched in one way or another by Harvey, Ike, and many of the storms that have hit our area, both tropical and non-tropical. Uh, many of us and our families and friends have been hit very hard. We all know people that have really struggled over the last few months and in the past uh, because of these events. Uh, elected officials, uh, you see them on TV, you hear them on the news, uh, are, are, are struggling to find uh, funds and, and resources to uh, for both from federal, state, and local budgets uh, to assist in recovery and uh, future investments and the tune of over $100 billion. However, uh, if we look back in the history of our community here, as well as other parts of Texas, we can see that a lot of this was probably avoidable and at a much cheaper pro, uh, price. But to avoid previous mistakes and ensure that our tax dollars 
are invested in the most effective manner, uh, residents, decision makers, elected officials have to make knowledgeable, informed decisions. Decisions rooted in good science and good engineering. Uh, I think one can be forgiving for being skeptical about the chance of this happening. And I know a lot of folks, you know, know the current stat situation in terms of politics and the polarization we have in many of our communities. Uh, but we're living in a bizarre time when far too many political leaders, including some at very high levels, make it a practice to dismiss science and demonize scientists and anyone who else who defends facts and evidence. Uh, a few weeks ago, Houston Chronicle carried an excellent story about a new Greater Houston Flood Mitigation Consortium made up of 11 institutions, including several of our universities in the region, supported by the Houston Endowment, several of the universe, uh, of, uh, Kinder Foundation and George Mitchell Foundation. This consortium will bring together the best minds in our region to offer solutions based on good science our real hope for progress, though, and optimism uh, derives from the people uh, who live in Houston and the surrounding region, informing ourselves and taking action. It's important that not only uh, that we all get engaged and become informed and learn about what needs to be done and what is practical and what can't and, and would, would make a difference. From students to plant workers, from IT specialists to real estate agents, from space industry workers to elected officials. We must learn uh, about the flood threats in our area, assess and advocate solutions, and engage with elected officials to make key societal decisions. With these efforts, we can protect our families, communities, and workplaces from future flooding events. Now, a little background myself. Um, I, again, am a professor and, and a director of the Environmental Institute uh, just down the road at the University of Houston Clear Lake. But more importantly, I grew up here in Houston um, on the east side in a neighborhood called Denver Harbor. Some of you may know of it. Relatively poor neighborhood. Now, one of my earliest childhood memories involved, and, and I apologize if I offend anybody, but I was very late at night and I was visiting the bathroom. And I was doing what little boys do. And it was very stormy night. And all of a sudden, the room lit up as bright as the sun, followed by a massive crack or explosion. And what had happened was the tree next to the bathroom had got blown up by a bolt of lightning. The next earliest memory I have as a child was being carried by my father very rapidly shortly thereafter to the church across the street that was a fault, default fallout shelter. It was only many years later that I found out that that bolt of lightning and that storm was Hurricane Carla. And so I've had many uh, 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 unfortunate incidents of being exposed to, having to ride through hurricanes, and I've seen neighbors and neighborhoods you know, demolished by past storms. And so I, I have a personal interest in helping solve this problem. Um, as a kid, father, and grandfather, I spent many summers and fall days camping, fishing, swimming here in Galveston Bay in our streams and bayous, and I've seen things slowly degrade over time. And I bring that up because the flooding issue is, is not an issue that occurs in a, in a vacuum. It's associated with a lot of other problems. Um, and uh, here, the Gulf Coast, Houston, and Galveston Bay, they're my home. And again, I hope that we will have some, some enlightenment tonight of some potential solutions to the problems we have. Um, but our land has changed and not necessarily for the better. Our way of managing has also lacked long-term vision. Uh, there are consequences for how we have managed our land and our resources. The various factors have collided to bring us to this point. They include rapid population growth and industrial growth, urbanization, rapid commercial development, lack of zoning, a broken flood risk management program, loss of green space, increase in impervious land, concrete, and so forth. 
channelization of our streams, and yes, sea level rise. Living and working in this part of the country, we are all vulnerable. We face future deadly storms and large financial losses. Um, Harvey showed what a flooding threat could be and the worst of it. It was not, however, the perfect storm, but what if it had been? The devastation and human hardship brought by Harvey and, like, and Ike and other similar storms before these, especially with the reality of climate change accompanied by sea level rise and the likelihood of more water uh, from the air, even the possibility of stronger, more frequent hurricanes should be an alarm call for action. Uh, but action requires policies based on facts and science, willingness of the public to help finance this process, and political support. Tonight we'll hear from two panels of experts who will discuss major rain event flooding and hurricane stir, uh, uh, storm surge flooding, as well as possible countermeasures and related approaches in the future. Before we get started, uh, I'd like to lay down uh, some ground rules for our speakers. Uh, again, we have two panels of speakers. The first is going to focus on rain event uh, flooding associated with storms like Harvey, Claudette, as well as just normal storm fronts that occur each year. Uh, the second panel will focus again on hurricane storm surge flooding and potential countermeasures that are being discussed right now. Uh, the panel speakers will sit up here as a group uh, at the table. Uh, a mic will be in the middle of the aisle of the audience for live questions and no cards will be distributed for follow-up questions. And uh, we also have a Twitter service, and I'm not a Twitter person, but um, we're using hashtag Flood Forum 2017 hashtag for people who wish to send questions to Twitter to be given to me during the question and answer session. Um, and uh, we will have a timekeeper up here uh, on the front row. We'll show a eight and a half by 11 sign uh, at three, one minute, and then alert the speaker that they uh, need to wrap it up. So um, with that, I would like to introduce and, um, our first panel. And uh, if you want to come up here and, and have a seat, please. All right, our uh, first panel uh, I'd like to introduce, starting from here, going uh, to the, the opposite direction. Uh, first uh, speaker will be Dr. Andre Droxler, who's a professor of Earth, Environmental, and Planetary Sciences at Rice University. His particular area of research is regional and global evolution of coral reefs through time and paleo-oceanographic uh, sea level re uh, records that have been deposited in sediments around the reefs and other carbonate platforms. Our second speaker is Stephen uh, Costello, uh, who's the Chief Resilience Officer uh, for the City of Houston and quote unquote flood czar. Uh, and he's trained as a civil engineer. He has extensive background in stormwater management uh, and flooding issues and has been a former Houston City at Large Council member. Uh, he has advised local and state government officials about these and related issues. Dr. John Jacob, uh, is the director of, of uh, oh, I'm sorry, um, John Branch is the president of the Clear Lake City Water Authority. In addition to his administrative duties, he's led, led Exploration, Exploration Green, a model flood water detention area of nearly 200 acres at the old golf course. Phase one of Exploration Green was thoroughly tested during Hurricane Harvey and was credited for saving about 200 f homes during the flooding. Uh, Dr. John Jacob uh, is the uh, director of the Texas Community Watershed Program and a professor and extension specialist at Texas A&M, Texas AgriLife Extension Service. He is a recognized expert in Texas wetlands uh, and has been very active in consulting and research of wetlands for more than two decades. And finally, uh, Lisa Gonzalez is president and CEO of the Houston Advanced Research Center and is responsible for strategic planning and research programs designed for sustainability to, uh, to manage local air, water, energy resources. Her research interests focus on the environmental health of the Texas Gulf Coast. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Droxler. <clears throat> a 
that's okay. Thank you very much. Good evening. It's a pleasure to, for me to be here. Um, I, uh, I'm a marine geologist and not really a, an atmos atmospheric scientist. I'm a paleoclimatologist and paleoceanographer. And um, what I'm going to try not to show you, you know, today is to try not to ask you know, the questions, you know, is Hurricane Harvey related you know, to climate change or global warming? And this is a very uh, kind of uh, interesting question, and it's not a question that is answered the same way you know, by different people. Um, and it's quite a complex, obviously a very complex you know, kind of uh, topic. This is you know, Harvey just reaching Rockport. You know, I think it was about 10 p.m. on Friday, uh, August 25th. And I was so lucky, I had planned a trip to Lesbos Island to attend a, a, a meeting on interglacial uh, periods. And I left on the last you know, air, uh, Turkish airline flight at 9 p.m. on Friday, August 25th. I returned on Thursday on the first flight probably that landed in Houston from Istanbul. So I was probably the, the luckiest person you know, kind of in Houston to avoid you know, kind of the entire ordeal. So sometimes you are lucky in life. So, oh, what do I do? Oh, down. Down, on, not up. Sorry, folks. OK. So you know, the, the question is you know, kind of, you know, is this you know, kind of related you know, to climate change? And uh, so I'm going to show you, you know, diff so different quotes from different papers that have been published you know, kind of since you know, Harvey. And so, you know, kind of as we know, you know, kind of Harvey you know, created more rain in Texas and Louisiana and, uh, that in a single storm. And this is an event that is, was never recorded really, even in the US. It was so dramatic, yes that we can call you now this a 1,000 year you know, flood. Often we talk about 100 year flood. You know, this is you know, kind of an event that hopefully is going to be a 1,000 year flood. But as you know, the 1,000 year flood can be repeated. And so are these 1,000 you know, kind of year flood going to be repeated in terms of, you know, in the context of the warming of the, the earth? This is you know, a map you know, of the rainfall you know, kind of in, uh, in Texas and uh, all of you have seen this, you know, kind of types of data. This is on you know, the National Weather Service. And for the first time, you know, they had to change the scale. You know, kind of the, uh, the scale before, you know, kind of was, you know, kind of greater than 15 inches. But, you know, here it is, you have, you know, kind of two new ones, you, know, you know, 20 to 30 inches and greater than 30 inches. So in one day, they had to change the scale. And this was, you know, kind of greater than 30 inches, nobody thought that this could be doubled. So this is, you know, kind of now the, the total rainfall, you know, kind of of Harvey. And you can see, you know, kind of there, the dark brown, 60 to 61, you know, kind of inches of rain. Something that nobody, you know, had ever imagined that could happen. And especially, you know, to happen in a place like, you know, the area of Houston, Beaumont, and Port Arthur, and I had to go and find out where that was Netherlands, you know, kind of Texas, where they had you no know, kind of this maximum of 60 inches plus of rain. It's between Beaumont and Port Arthur, if you didn't know about it. So, oh well, this is an, an amazing map. You can go and look at it for longer, yes, because it is, <laughs> it is such an amazing event, yes, an event that uh, nobody could have imagined, probably. So, you know, already, you know, kind of early, you know, kind of in 2017, people were a bit uh, worried. You know, the, the Gulf of, of Mexico, the Western Gulf, was in March, you know, four degree, four degree, you know, kind of warmer than normal. And so this quote you know, from the Washington Post from Jason Samano, it says, you know, kind of friskly warm, which could mean explosive springtime storm. So he was kind of already predicting that, you know, this unusually warm Gulf of Mexico, you can see, you know, kind of this reddish, you know, part of the Western Gulf, which had, you know, kind of this unusually, you know, kind of warm conditions. Probably, you know, you remember our winter last, this year in 2017. It lasted, at least in Houston, two days. It went 
from the warm, you know, kind of 80 plus to 22, went back to 80 in less than a week. So this was a very short winter for us, but it means kind of, you know, kind of our no cold fronts, you know, kind of went through, you know, kind of the Gulf of Mexico and the sea surface temperature of the Gulf remained very warm. Uh -oh. Here it is. So, you know, we had the, the, the luck, you know, at Rice University, probably even five years, five weeks ago, to have Al Gore, and you mentioned you know, this, I took a picture of, of this quote, that, you know, Hurricane Harvey, you know, crossed waters in the Gulf of Mexico that were seven degree Fahrenheit, you know, or four degrees Celsius, you know, higher than normal, and down, you know, kind of to 200 meters. So there's an amazing amount of heat that is stored, you know, kind of within, you know, kind of the ocean, yes. And so this is, you know, kind of a curve of temperature anomalies, and it's within, you know, kind of uh, an anomaly relative you know, to the last 30 years. And uh, here, you know, what you see, you know, you see from 1880, to 2017, and so this is, you know, kind of this uh, increase of temperature in particular, you know, kind of from about, you know, kind of 1970s, you can see, you know, this, you know, kind of stepwise, but you no know, continuous, you know, kind of increase of temperature. Here, you know, kind of about from 2000 to about 2013, we thought that maybe, you know, kind of the, uh, the increase was not, you know, kind of as, as fast, but suddenly, you know, we have, you know, this here, you know, this event, 2016, 2015, 2016 is, you know, kind of the year. Oh, 30, three minutes ago. So, okay, I better go and get going. But it's warming. And so, um, here, you know, it's the, the heat in the, in the ocean, you know, at different types of depth. So, this energy, you know, kind of, which is, you know, stored in the ocean. And uh, if you look, you know, here at, you know, it's between zero and 2,000 meters. In, in so energy, you know, kind of stored in the ocean, and the CO2 increase that you know probably that uh, since the uh, onset of the industrial revolution, we went from 280 to now 400 plus. And so, you know, so not everybody you know kind of feel that uh, you know kind of global warming has anything to do you know, with you know kind of the event, and one of them is Roy Spencer, and what he did is kind of interesting. He looked here you know, at, you know, the temperature in the Gulf of Mexico, you know, from 1870 to 18, uh, uh, 2017, and you can see that kind of, and the, the red dots are, you know, kind of major hurricanes that have occurred, you know, within this period of time, and you would say, well, you know, there's no correlation. You know, kind of these hurricanes didn't occur, you know, kind of at the peaks, but almost at any time. So, and why you not know, kind of this hurricane stall? This is kind of the major issues. You now, the, the issues we have had is because, you know, kind of this, you know, a hurricane has remained within the coastal area for two or three days at a time. And so, you know, um, probably some of you might have heard of Michael Mann, and uh, he says it's a fact. Climate change made Hurricane Harvey more deadly, meaning much stronger, yes? But, you know, kind of, we cannot say that Hurricane Harvey was caused by climate change, but it was certainly no kind of, uh, it make it no kind of worse than it was. And so, you know, kind of, um, when you look, you know, at this recent hurricane, warming, the change, you know, kind of, of fossil fuel, and therefore the uh, emission of, of uh, greenhouse gases are, you know, kind of connected, you know, kind of to this warming, you know, kind of, of the earth on a global scale, yes. And so that, you know, kind of three major trouble, you know, kind of in, um, I mean, t t uh, factors that have, have created, you know, Harvey has a major, you know, kind of event is the intensification very fast, you know, kind of the, um, the fact that it stalled, you know, kind of along the coast and dumped so much rain on the wet side of the system. Okay, so I mean, better go pretty fast. So. Uh, this is an interesting you know, kind of way of looking, you know, kind of on the right side is the sea surface temperature, you know, which was, you know, kind of in more than 30 degrees Celsius. And here is, you know, kind of the track of Harvey, where did, and this, you know, the darker um, orange there, this is, you know, um, a hurricane force uh, fall. And um, let's see. So what, how come, you know, it's, it was so intense, yes? And so it's intense, you know, mostly, you know, because, 
you know, it's, it's going to be in, um, influenced by this unusual temperature, and it's also going to bring, you know, so much rain because of the temperature, of it, about you know, kind of this increase, you know, of evaporation. So, okay, so I'm going to go a little bit uh, quickly on this one. So, if we look, you know, at, um, oh, I'm going backwards. So I'm going to go very slow. <laughs> My God, I'm thinking. Uh, all right, here it is. So uh, here, interesting enough, you know, when you go, you know, kind of to the northern part of the Gulf, you know, here, you know, a hurricane passed through and cools off, you know, kind of the ocean. This is you know, one week, you know, after Hurricane Harvey. So let me go, you know, kind of here to see at least, you know, kind of this is kind of interesting is how you know, kind of the precipitation was, you know, kind of unfortunately, you know, focused on the west side of this system when it was, you know, kind of here, you know, stop, you know, kind of on this system there. You can see, you know, how, you know, kind of the purplish area of Houston comes in. Thanks God, Harvey went past this way and didn't go, you know, kind of, uh, you know, through Houston uh, on its way northeast, yes. Okay. And it stalled mostly, you know, because it was caught, you know, by, you know, these two high pressure system I need to make you know, clockwise here and clockwise there. And this system was stalled there because of this too high pressure system. And here also of this large ridge, you know, of or large, you know, kind of flow of air, you know, kind of on the, on the north side, you know, kind of there. So this event, you know, when the system is stalled, I know I'm going to get two minutes probably extra. Uh, so it's, stalled there, and this system, when it's, it's really, you know, kind of, when the system that does not really move, when this high pressure system remain, every member remember this. This is 2011, it's when we had the droughts. Houston, you know, had this amazing, you know, high temperature, you know, for the month of August, which was always, you know, kind of 100 and plus. So when the, this atmospheric circulation is very weak, you know, we have very, um, uh, very you know, kind of unusual extreme climate change you know, event. Okay, and in conclusion, you know, as we know, that there were several factors you know, kind of conspires you not know, to make Hurricane Harvey, Irma, and Maria unusually you know strong, so destructive, mostly you know because of the warming you know of the uh, the, the ocean, and this warming you know has has occurred in the last thirty years. Also, you know, kind of um, no single event like Harvey, you know, can, cannot be directly, you know, kind of related, you know, kind of to climate change or global warming. It would be you know, kind of silly to think so. But the fact, you know, kind of that we had, you know, kind of this increase of temperature related, you know, kind of to this fossil fuel, you no know, kind of burning and CO2 emission, this would have created an unusual system like Harvey, you know, uh, Irma or Maria, and to be so destructive. Thank you very much. Our next speaker uh, is Stephen Costello, who will be talking about Hurricane Harvey impacts. And yeah, I was going to say, if you're, you're more Thank than you. welcome to use the mic. So is everybody hear me? Oh, great. Okay. I have a tendency of walking around, so I don't want to stand behind the podium if you don't mind. But so I'm, I'm here just to, I'm going to go through quickly a couple of the exhibits just so you get a feel for numbers, the magnitude of the flood. I've been in this business over 40 years. I've never, ever, ever envisioned having a flood of the magnitude that Harvey actually brought to this region. And, and I'll describe to you the frustration that someone in my business, in terms of stormwater management, has experienced over the years that Harvey might change. And so these are the numbers, fairly large numbers, uh, in terms of the magnitude relative to the flood event. But I think what's really profound is these numbers on how many houses, how many people asked for public assistance, which means they called FEMA and they said, we need some assistance because we've been flooded. And that is a combination of homeowners, renters, as well as apartment dwellers. So that is, that is incredible amount of data there. But this is what's so unique. This is an exhibit of the flooded houses that we go out and survey right after the flood, but only the houses that are in the 100-year floodplain. And so what's so unique about this particular exhibit is the fact that 
it's not representing all of the flooding. Over 40% of the houses that flooded were not in a regulatory floodplain. That's what's so unique about Harvey, is the fact that it really changed the dynamics of a particular flood and how we regulate development within floodplains. The other issue is here is the frustration of someone in the stormwater management field. For years, we have been advocating for infrastructure investment in stormwater reduction. And for years, it falls on deaf ears, both in terms of the public as well as the political leadership. And why is that? Because historically, when we have a flood, it only impacts a small percentage of the community. So for instance, the floods that we had in 2015, the flood that we had tax day of 2016, only hit an isolated area of the city. And so 90% of the city didn't flood. So 90% of the people really weren't paying much attention to the rainfall event post the flood. And then prior to 2015 and 16, those floods were seven or eight years apart, which even the people who had flooded and who had recovered and who had rebuilt seven or eight years later have really forgot about it. And so that was the challenge with people who advocate for infrastructure investment that this is the issue that we need to continue to invest in infrastructure. That was one of the reasons why last year the mayor asked me to come work for him and to be the flood czar. His thought process is, is that we want to make sure every day, and we remind the community every day, as well as political leadership, that we have to continue to invest in infrastructure and stormwater reduction. Now, that was post-Harvey, pre-Harvey. We didn't expect Harvey to happen. So my job was a lot easier before Harvey occurred, but now it's gotten a little bit more complicated. So, but I wanted to point out this area right here. This is Sims Bayou. And by the way, if the federal project wasn't done on Sims Bayou, it would have looked like that. And that's unique because of what I'm going to talk about next. And so we have been asking the federal government for disaster recovery. Now, on the city side, we actually get funding from two primary sources, and that is FEMA, and is really what we call disaster recovery, which includes debris pickup, uh, housing, emergency housing, and then post the flood is what we call uh, repair and rehabilitate. So everything that's been damaged over the year, we figure out what the damage assessments are, and then FEMA pays us for those. But that's a negotiating process that takes a couple of years to get accomplished. The other part of the funding source is through HUD, which is Community Development Block Grant money for primarily housing, but it's also used for infrastructure. And so what we've been asking for, the city alone has asked for over $32 billion in recovery. So this is what we have here for the state of Texas. First allocation, post-Harvey, $15 billion combined between FEMA and HUD. Now that is for all of the state of Texas, okay? That was the original assessment. Then what happened was Congress passed another allocation of about $36 billion, but that was for half of it went to pay off debt for the National Flood Insurance Program. The other half was for all disasters in 2017. So now we're competing with Harvey, Irma, Maria, and the fires in California. And so there is this issue that we're not really getting the money that we really need to get to go to not only recovery, but also to resiliency, which is what my job is with the city's resiliency. And so that's a challenge that we have. So uh, this is you know, some of our immediate response. The very first thing the mayor said was when during the event, while we were sitting in the emergency operations center for a week, he said to me, he said, Steve, you first get evaluated pre-storm event, you get evaluated during the storm event, and then you get evaluated during the recovery. And so his number one charge to his staff was, I wanted debris picked up as quickly as possible. And so that had a double-edged sword to it because we were able to effectively do that, but then what happened was people outside of the region see that Houston actually has recovered, and we haven't really recovered. We just picked up all the trash. And so that's one of the problems we're having in terms of getting our message to the congressional leadership is we haven't quite recovered. And so that's one of the problems we have. So what are we doing? And so I want to talk a little bit about what the city's doing. So we have created a recovery team, and I am an integral part of the recovery team. The recovery team is primarily housing, public infrastructure, and resiliency. And each one of them has a different time frame. 
In housing, we're trying to get people in housing as quickly as possible. We're trying to buy out areas where we have the resources to buy them out. In infrastructure recovery and rehabilitation, because of the negotiations we're having with FEMA, will take three to five years. My role is to look at what do we do three, five, ten years out. So I have a different horizon compared to the other people that are on the recovery team. And so I, I, I show this exhibit. It's, I know it's hard to see, but it's really a highlight of the six ongoing federal projects that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is doing with Harris County Flood Control District. Half of them are being managed by the Corps. The other half is being managed by the district. So when I took the job, I said, okay, uh, right after Harvey, we decided to figure out, okay, what are we going to do now, now that we're going to recover from Harvey? So if you think about it, we have three baselines. The very first baseline is Harvey. The second one is a regulatory floodplain. And then the third is what we call urban infrastructure. And I say that because if you go back to this exhibit, up in Kingwood area, over here, and on the west side, downstream of the reservoirs, they had never flooded before. What they flooded from was an event called Harvey. So as we look through how we're going to address their resiliency long term, we're going to have to decide, particularly up in Kingwood, do we lower the reservoir levels in Lake Euston and Lake Conroe to accommodate a future flood event, even though those are our primary water supplies? No, that's a thought process. That's a resiliency effect. On the west side of town, do we take a look at the operations of Addicts and Barker? Do we advocate for the construction of a third reservoir to control the downstream outflow coming out of the reservoirs? Or do we do improvements to Buffalo Bayou, which we've never done before? So those are some of the things that we're looking at long term. And also on the critical infrastructure, we had nine plants that were totally inundated, wastewater treatment plants. So the thought process is, rather than build them in a hazard area, do we want to relocate them? Do we want to consolidate the system and just abandon them entirely? So those, this, is, this is my horizon. That's essentially what I'm working on. And then here, the next level, the next baseline is our regulatory floodplain. So this is where Public Works is working on our infrastructure rehabilitation. What I'm looking at is what other projects can we be working on to supplement our ongoing federal projects? And this is important when you look at, this is Project Braze. This is the residual floodplain for Project Braze. What I'm looking at is this area right here. It's still subject to flooding. So what options do we have available to get rid of that floodplain in the future? I'm looking at a capital improvement plan on Keegan's Bayou and then relocating a 150-acre landfill site. No one's ever thought of that. But it's in a perfect location in the watershed to become a regional detention pond. I just got to figure out if I can get $200 million to move the landfill site. So those are some of the things that we're looking at in terms of thinking out of the box, because that's what we have to do. And then the next baseline is what we call urban flooding, because that's really what Public Works does, is they deliver the urban infrastructure for the nominal rainfall events. And so what we need to do now post-Harvey is to take a look at, do we have the right criteria? Are there other options that we do to provide urban infrastructure? For instance, we have 360 parks throughout the city. Half of them, more than half, are not even used. Why can't we integrate them as detention and do different infrastructure to provide urban infrastructure and green space. So these are some of the things that we're working on long term. And so I'll be happy to sit down because I'm going to keep you on schedule, number one. And unfortunately, John's going to follow me. And by the way, John and I have had a number of discussions, and we're always at the opposite end. So <laughs> I, I want to thank you all for being here. I'll be happy to talk about whatever you guys want to talk about later. Okay, thanks. Good. Good setup. <laughs> Are you going to say something? I'll introduce you. Um, the next speaker is Dr. John Jacob, and he's going to, his topic and his presentation is Learning to Embrace Our Limits. Thank you very much. All right, we got that up. Okay. All right, well, I am with the Texas Coastal Watershed Program. We deal in watersheds. Watersheds integrate everything. They integrate the what, the where, and the how. We develop. Today, we're mostly talking about the where, but we'll get a little bit into the what and the how. Um, oh, let's see, got to hit that the right, down is up, okay, down is up, that's the whole story right here. Uh, as has been said, Harvey was a, was a game changer. How many of you were actually flooded in Harvey? Just raise your hands right up. How many of you were scared you might be flooded? And how many of you know somebody who was flooded right out of their house? Almost everybody. So that's why this is a game changer. This is a visceral storm for us. 
you know, tax day, Memorial Day. Sure, it might a few people might have known, but now, you know, I did. I asked the same question to the downtown forum. Same thing. Everybody knows somebody, so it's definitely a game changer. Now, some of our there's some uh, a lot of discussion, of course, going on about, you know, could we have prevented this? No amount of prevention could have prevented this kind of flooding. This was very soon after Harvey. One, you know, someone, one of our city leaders, I don't remember who, I removed all the, all the names of the innocent and guilty, right? <laughs> How many of you would agree with that? Not very many people. I don't agree with it either. This is another little bit more famous one that was bandied around. Zoning would not have changed anything. We would have been a city with zoning that flooded. Well, sure, if zoning is only about R3 uh, residential over here and C2 over there, okay, sure. But zoning is just one piece of land use planning, right? So another form of land use planning are, is a floodplain ordinance. It's still zoning, okay? So we could have changed that. Imagine, uh, and, and we should say this, a strong, a strong floodplain ordinance, not a weak floodplain ordinance, a strong one floodplain ordinance, would have changed everything. We would have been a city with an ordinance that minimized who got flooded. So that is a central take home message that I have here tonight. This was totally avoidable. This is a city that could definitely have handle, handled just about all that Harvey threw at us. It would have been a nuisance, a major nuisance. Perhaps we would have lost a few lives here and there, but it would not have been the total disaster that we have experienced now. So that's gonna color a lot of what I'm gonna say here. So let's get two things straight here. There's flooding and there's impacts. They're two separate, they're related, but they are separate things. So here, this is Buffalo Bayou streaming merrily along to downtown, but in this particular photo, nobody's getting hurt, or at least not many. There were a few people maybe a little bit too close. But in general, nobody's getting hurt here, okay? This is flooding without impacts. This needs to be our standard. This is flooding with impacts. This should not have happened, and it's incredible that it could happen in the 21st century right here in our fair city. This was the La Bella Vita nursing home built in the floodplain, built on slab, built on, on grade. It's just incredible that it could have been done. So this can be avoided. This cannot. We cannot fight the floods. We can change what we do that causes us to get into trouble. Now all of, many of you, and I know many of you here, know me as the wetland guy, right? I'm the prairie pothole guy. I'm always out there, you know, talking about these, prairie, these potholes. And these are an important part of our, of our flood plain ecology here. They do detain water. They actually detain about a third of an acre foot per acre. So they have a significant volume that is not mitigated, by the way, uh, in, uh, under any uh, circumstance just about. Uh, I also talk about things like rainwater detention, what we call green stormwater infrastructure. Uh, so some people would call this the sponge city. You know, these are practices you can do, swells and whatnot. Certainly important part of, you know, the flood, the flood ecology that we have. And obviously the things that Steve spent a lot of time uh, in your earlier life building these uh, channels and the drainage system. All of these things are needed. Now here's a fundamental point. All of these things were overwhelmed with Harvey. Everything filled up. All bets are off. All of the wetlands that I strongly advocate for so strongly, they all filled up. All the little, anybody, everybody's swell or anything like that, that all filled up. And every single detention pond and every conveyance, all of it was, was overwhelmed. So again, Harvey is a major game changer. Certainly has changed my thinking. So wetlands are still important, no question about it. We need them. They're important for the smaller floods. They're important for water quality and a whole host of uh, natural processes uh, that occur there. So if, if this is true, I think we need to think, rethink a little bit uh, our, our system. So this is similar to what uh, uh, Steve showed, Stephen showed you a, a few minutes ago. This is not quite as pretty as the map you had, so I'll need to get your copy. But one thing that should, should stand out to you, there may be some flooding here outside of the floodplains, but this pattern says the flooding, most of the flooding, occurred in the flood plains. All right, we've got to get that, that straight. Now, some of that would have been out of the regulatory flood plain, 
But I would argue that it's still in what we would call the, the geomorphic or the real floodplain. All rivers, all bayous, all creeks, as they flow across the landscape for the eons and the thousands of years, scoop out a valley, okay? And that is a floodplain, and the river meanders back and forth. It gets out of its banks, its banks. It floods that floodplain. You know, and I'm talking about, again, the real floodplain, not whether, uh, you know, there's a smaller floodplain here that was drawn by FEMA. These are the actual floodplains. Well, this is the, in my estimation, this is the natural green infrastructure that we need to focus on. In my estimation, this has not been quantified. I'm just kind of arm waving here a little bit with some substance. Uh, but the, my contention would be that, that we have enough capacity in our floodplains, okay, if there's not any houses in there, but we have enough capacity in those floodplains to handle what Harvey might throw at us. So I hope to be, you know, disproven or not, but there's something we need to talk about. All right, we saw something like this. This is the floodplain map uh, of, our, of Harris County. The blue lines, the blue uh, uh, areas are the, let's see, went the wrong way. The blue is the 100-year uh, floodplain, and then this uh, light brown here is the, uh, the blue is the 100-year floodplain, and the brown is the 500-year floodplain, okay? We should all pretty well know about that, but the real story is told right here. Here we have overlain development on the floodplain. So it's not development everywhere, it's just development in the floodplains. So the dark blue is development that has occurred in the 100-year floodplain. The, the yellow is development that has occurred in the 500-year floodplain. We got troubles here, we got a problem. We got a lot of people, you know, we've got 572,000 homes in flood, plain, flood zones. Now obviously they didn't all flood, but I would, I would wager that practically all of the houses that did flood, and certainly all of those that flooded significantly, were in one of these, one of these flood plains, 500 year or 100 year. This is where the most serious flooding occurred. So we need to come to terms with flood plains. We need to lean into our vulnerabilities, recognize this is the vulnerability we have. It's gonna flood, the, the, the creeks, the bayous, in fact, need to flood to, uh, to be able to function ecologically. So we have a little bit of a problem with our floodplains, right? We like to encroach in our floodplains for some reason. Uh, here's Brazos River. Here's houses right out in the floodplain itself. Now, in this case, now we, we oftentimes will develop out in the floodplains just you know, by themselves without doing anything. In this case, we've built a nice levee along here, a nice strong levee uh, to protect ourselves, right? There's a little bit of a problem with levees though, right? We call it in the trade, we call it a moral hazard. A moral hazard is when something is done that incentivizes you to do the wrong thing. All right, so in this case, you look at this levee and you say, oh, this is okay over here. I'll build a, I'll build a house, I'll build a neighborhood. No problem, because after all, it's a levee. It must, it must work, right? Well, we know from listening to the county judge over there, uh, this past, during a storm, you know, they were talking, I don't remember what the exact level was, but well, if we go over 58 feet, we're in trouble, right? And it was getting up to whatever level he talked about. So we need to think about this in terms of any structural uh, element that we put on the ground. And I'm not saying there's no cause ever for levees, for dikes, et cetera, but we must talk, we must address this issue of the moral hazard. And so I hope the, the next panel will at least address that. Again, I'm not saying Ike Dyke, no, no Ike Dyke, or, or, or whatever other uh, levees you have out there. But this is, you know, if we're going to make these decisions, we've got to make them with our eyes wide open. So there's two basic approaches here. One is an engineering resilience, right? We engineer, we try to put in structures that will keep uh, the floods away from people. The other is an ecological resilience. And here we're trying to keep the people away from the flood. So, and uh, further along these lines, an engineering resilience, we're talking about fail safe. That's how you have to build it, fail safe. Because you can't say, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna build it to where it fails. Because if it fails, these guys are in deep water. Uh, <laughs> Actually, with some of those sewer plants you were talking about, they could be, they could be, in, they could be a little trouble there. Yeah, 
So the ecological resilience idea is safe fail. Okay? We know the river's going to flood. We let it flood. There's that failure, but we keep the people away from the floods. We live in this kind of area, folks. We live in an area that floods. It's flat. It rains. We, you know, we, need to, we need to deal with it. Now, I'm not saying no engineering at all. We, we certainly still need that, but the pendulum, I think, needs to swing a little bit over this way. All right, I am out of time, so I'm going to forget that. You know, what about those people that are in the floodplains right now? These are difficult questions. They're not just technical questions. They're issues of people, their neighborhoods, et cetera. But in the future, we've got, we've got to lay these things out. We either need to elevate. Uh, we can elevate laterally, which would, we would say that's evacuate the floodplain. And if we do that, then we need to dedicate these areas to where we don't uh, continue to build uh, in them. Elevation, well, that's going to work for certain areas, maybe some places in Meyerland. This costs two to 300,000 bucks. So if your house costs 150,000 bucks, it might not be quite worth it. Uh, but we could, if we planned ahead, you know, we could turn some of these areas, you know, painful though it might be, into open space, parks, ball fields, et cetera. You know, we, this, reclaiming the floodplain, at least the deeper floodplains, could make a major difference in the kind of city we are and our relationship to the green space around us. Uh, pier and beam. You know, what about that? Here I live on Eastwood. This is my house. I'm seven feet above the street. I'm seven feet above the street. I got extra buffer because we got 35 inches, the, 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 the same that most other folks got. The water didn't even get up this high. So I've got extra buffer, okay? And the east end is a little bit convex. So, you know, even with our 35 inches, we didn't flood. Bel Air is just a little bit concave. So 35 inches flooded them. All right, and knowing where these areas are, this is going to be a, a major game changer. People knowing where it floods. This is a company that's working with uh, insurance folks. There's people who are starting to step into the insurance market. Okay, and I am going to quit right here. Oh, okay. All right, so this is the last one. Houston, the city with no limits. We got to forget that. We've got to become Houston, the city that embraces limits. That's us. That'll make us a healthy, wealthy place. Okay. Okay. Our next speaker is John Branch. He's going to be talking about looking for answers and case study exploration green. And I just want to remind folks, if you have any questions, you know, they have those cards you can pass up. Uh, please send them to us, uh, and I'll, okay, thank you. Do you want this, or? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I feel very humbled to be here um, um, among this uh, panel of very distinguished people who collectively have more degrees than a thermometer. Um, so those of you that are engineers probably understood everything you said. For those that, that are not, that's where I come in. So I'm going to take it down a notch and put it into terms uh, that we non-engineers uh, can understand. So we're always looking for answers. Uh, our answer within uh, the Clerk City Water Authority, which is about 16,000 acres uh, with about 88,000 people that live within our boundaries, is the largest water district in the state of Texas. Uh, what our project is is called Exploration Green. It is a detention project uh, that uh, we have funded. There's some principles that I work under, okay? Number one, there's no single answer to flooding. So what we tried to do as a water authority in the district is to look within our own boundaries and look for what, are we can, what can we do. We are downhill from Houston. We're downhill from Pasadena. We're downhill from Ellington Field. And as that area has developed over the years, we've seen flooding become worse and worse in our area. There's more runoff, and flooding is stormwater runoff. So we looked and thought, well, yeah, what is it that can we do? So what we did, uh, we, we understood and, uh, that um, the old Clear Lake Golf Club uh, was going to be closed in 2005. So we hired two hydrologists, uh, Dr. Phil Bedian uh, from Rice and uh, Larry Dunbar, and said, yeah, how is this going to impact us if this gets converted to high-density development? What's that going to do to our area? 
And so they came back with the answer, and we said, well, okay, go back and tell us what we can do to help mitigate the increase in flooding. So our answer, it may not be the same that everybody else has, but this takes care of, of our 16,000 acres. Another principle that I work under is when water falls from the sky, it has to go somewhere, and it always goes to the lowest point. Okay? We're downhill. Okay? So we looked and decided, okay, how can we understand that, and what is it that we can do? For local governments, it's always about looking for opportunities and seizing them as quickly as possible. When we found out that the golf course was going to close, we went to the city of Houston and to Harris County and said, hey, can you buy this property and turn it into a park, and then later on we can put detention in? And the answer was, no, we have this process. It's a capital improvement program, and you have to get in line. It'll probably take six or seven years. And meanwhile, we had a, an owner of that property uh, that wanted to break the restrictions and, and, and uh, develop it real quickly. So we realized that when we said somebody needs to do something, we realized we looked around and it was us. Okay? Smaller government can work quicker and can react quicker. And so in a lot of cases, an answer is on the smallest level possible. So what is it that we can do? We can establish realistic stormwater detention requirements by watershed. Right now, Harris County uses averages for the whole county to determine stormwater detention. Their re detention requirement is one half acre foot per acre. So think of a football field with six inches of water on top of it. Our hydrologist came back and used the same formula and said, for our area with our rainfall, for our soil type, for our elevation, we should have one acre foot. So instead of having a football field that's six inches high, we had, we're creating one that's 12 inches high. And that's what it is. That is kind of the zero point where development is mitigated and will not cause increased flooding to other areas. The third point is stop allowing new development in floodplains. I'm just an old East Texas farm boy. But one thing I knew is that you don't build your house down in the valley. Okay? So why does government continue to allow new developments going into areas that we know are in floodplains? Okay, money, that's always, yeah. <laughs> that's politics, right? It's always money. Okay. So what we did, we, uh, we found out uh, in, in th from the recommendation we had um, that we could buy that golf course and we could retrofit it because those subdivisions uh, were created before detention was actually required in Harris County. So as you can see uh, from the area there, what we've got is a piece of property that's very long, very narrow. Not ideal for what you really want to do, but the nice thing is that all the street drains already go into the area because that's where the drainage ditches were. They were between the two fairways. So it was actually a perfect piece of property to get a hold of to, to, uh, to uh, create a, a detention facility. The next thing we realized was that you have to create public support with a multi-purpose green space detention. When, when most people think of detention ponds, they're thinking of a big, a big hole in the ground with a fence around it that never gets mowed. Okay? So what we did was we went to the people. We had town hall meetings, and we said, what would you like to see in this facility? Okay. What you see here is kind of the, uh, the first section. They wanted um, habitat islands. Um, for birds, and one of these is the uh, pointer here. Okay, well, we won't worry about that. Um, go back one. Okay, we'll just skip one. We're going to go to uh, the first phase. This is um, uh, the golf course was chopped up into five pieces because of streets. Um, we started, uh, you know, it, it was a long term process. You know, it took us six years to actually acquire the property. And then it took us almost four years to get a permit from the state. So these things don't happen quickly, uh, but you've got to just have persistence. Uh, we got the first one in. Uh, thank you to uh, all the voters within the Water Authority that approved the $28 million bond so that we could put this in. Uh, this one was about 80% um, uh, complete. 
when Hurricane Harvey hit. Okay, that same area that you saw before, won't go backwards, but you saw that it was just a little bit of water and a, and a great big, you don't get 3D, oh, there it comes, okay, uh, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it, Jason, you're a good man. Uh, g give yourself a raise. Um, it, there's a lot of, you don't get death perception in, in pictures, okay, but there's a big drop, okay, from ground level down to where you see the um, constant water level there. Okay, at Harvey, it filled up to the banks. That is 100 million gallons of storm water that it collected. There's another piece of it, and you can see how high. It'll only get to a certain height until you get to this, which is a spillway. And you can see where it is. Not only did it come over the spillway, which prevents it from going into the homes, um, the, the Harris County drainage ditch is almost out of its banks there. Okay, so you can imagine if that wasn't there, all those homes around that old golf course would have been significantly underwater. And we got, we got four more pieces to go of it, so. Learning, status quo is no longer acceptable. Every detention area should be a green space. Make it something nice, dual purpose. It's our tax dollars. Let's get the most out of it that we can. Another learning was everybody's a partner. Dr. John Jacob, who you just heard, okay, great guy. He lived 50 yards from the golf course, and that's how we got to know him. <laughs> it was personal at that point, okay. Uh, uh, trees for Houston, donating 1,000 trees for each section, so a total of 5,000 trees. Um, uh, Galveston Bay Foundation uh, holds our, our conservation easement and helped us get um, uh, different grants to help build things. Um, so that's a, a very important. And the last, in the battle between man and nature, nature always wins. What, what the key is to figure out, how do you work with nature? That's always the key. Use gravity, don't use pumps, things like that. Just the basic things that you learned in high school science, okay, can be used and applied in principles like this. They can put, you know, 50 cent words on top of it and all, but this is just kind of basics here, okay? So what you end up with is less flooded houses, streets that are, are lower that you can actually get out. If you realize, okay, the rain's coming, it's getting serious, I think I need to get out of here, okay? If those streets aren't cleared, no streets are the first part of the drainage system. Then it goes into the, uh, the drainage ditches and then out into the bios. So anything you can do to keep water out of people's houses and out of the streets is a good thing. And if you do your job well, you get reelected. So <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, our last speaker for this session is uh, Lisa Gonzalez, and she'll be talking about resilience going beyond recovery. Lisa? Thank you, George. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here tonight, and it's wonderful to be here with this distinguished panel of speakers, and I know we've got some other wonderful speakers to come. So I will round out uh, this panel with some thoughts on resilience. At HARC, we're a sustainability organization. And so for us to think about the concept of resilience, it's really not that different from the concept of sustainability. If you are a resilient region, you're also a, a sustainable region. And so resilience is a word that we hear used a lot these days, particularly in the weeks and months since Harvey. And it's one of those terms that can be pretty broad and pretty vague and mean different things to different people, but for us, when we think about resilience, it definitely includes recovery, but it actually goes beyond recovery. And to be truly resilient, what we also need to think about is how do we adapt so that we can withstand and be more resistant to those uh, disturbances like Harvey and, and other events that come our way. So for us in Texas, it always seems we're managing to extremes, doesn't it? People like to say, if you don't like the weather, just wait a minute and it will change. Um, right now, we're, of course, in a flood cycle with Hurricane Harvey and the Tax Day flood and Memorial Day flood before that. 
but it wasn't that long ago that we were in a historic drought, a drought that we not had not seen the likes of since the 1950s, and that was just five or six years ago. So when we think about resilience, even though the focus right now is on flooding, as a region, we also need to think about the other ways that water impacts us. We can have too much water, but we can also have too little. So planning for flood and drought as we, we build that capacity to increase resilience as a region. The other types of impacts, of course, that uh, we deal with here regionally is sea level rise. That's uh, something that isn't as acute as a storm that hits us over a period of a, a day or, or four days, but it's something that gradually occurs over a period of, of years and, and decades. So we hear a lot, of course, that Harvey was an unprecedented event for our region and for the country, and it was. But I think we do ourselves a disservice if we think of it as a once-in-a-lifetime event. What science and what the data is telling us is that these types of extreme events um, are increasing in terms of frequency. And what you can see from this graph um, from NOAA, these are billion-dollar disasters from 1980 through 2016. And you can see over the course of the last 10 to 20 years, we have an increase in these types of, of large events. Also, we have uh, scientists, uh, a study came out from MIT just before uh, the Thanksgiving holiday that talked about the likelihood of extreme flood events, saying that events that we may have thought of occurring every 100 years back in 2000, we could be seeing extreme events on the order of every five to six years by the end of the century. We can debate the accuracy of the models that they use, but we're, we're seeing a consistent story coming from the, the science that tells us these types of, of extreme events um, are likely to increase as time goes on. So typically when we think about disaster, we think about a, a typical cycle of getting a warning, of evacuating, of rescuing folks, and of recovering and kind of getting ready for that next event to strike. Resilience thinking is actually a different thought process and it's uh, something that it's going to take some time for us to learn to embrace. Basically, it starts with assessing your vulnerabilities and that could be things like drought, hurricanes, sea level, uh, heat waves, floods. Um, after that, we, we have to think about how do we communicate the risk and mitigate that risk. How do we communicate risk to homeowners? We have a, a many homeowners in the region that didn't understand their flood risk before Harvey, and we likely still have a lot of, of folks in the region who don't understand their flood risk going forward. And how do we mitigate that risk to uh, humans, uh, to the environment, because there were environmental impacts associated with Harvey and uh, to our, our economy. The other, the next step of the process is to think about developing opportunities. So very often when we talk about these type of events, we get caught up in kind of a, a very depressing um, discussion about increased likelihood of events and losses due to storms. But as we think about the long term, how can we create opportunities to, to increase resilience, whether that's increasing capacity of our, our communities, developing new financial strategies, or developing uh, new technologies? And, and new science to help us going forward. Lastly, it's about adapting, and that's the hard part because that's about changing behavior. And we know that's one of the toughest things to do, and, and this is where politics gets involved as well. And so this is something, it's an iterative process, but it's, it's something that we're in it for the long term. It's, it's not going to happen overnight or even a period of, of weeks and months, but this is kind of a new way of thinking uh, going forward. So watersheds have been mentioned a lot tonight, and that was one of the things that I was heartened to hear after Harvey was the word watershed and people understanding that they live in watersheds. This is some work that we did for a project called the Galveston Bay Report Card in partnership with the Galveston Bay Foundation. And we developed an index for the watersheds in the Houston-Galveston region that ranks the watersheds according to the percentage of land that's developed and the percentage of wetlands that have been lost from 1996 through 2010. This data is seven years old. We're waiting for the next data set to come out from the federal government, but it still tells a good story. And what you can see, and these colors are coordinated with what you see on the map, 
But these watersheds at the top of the list, Brays, White Oak, Buffalo, these are the watersheds uh, that are the most highly developed, have lost the most wetlands over the years, and these are typically the watersheds that we see with repeat flooding and water quality concern. Likewise, at the bottom of the list, those are watersheds that are out here in kind of the, the farther reaches of the region, upstream and downstream of the main urban areas. And these are some of the areas where, where the flooding concerns and water quality concerns aren't quite as acute. One of the things that we know for with 100% certainty is that water does not stop at the boundaries of municipalities and of, of county governments. And so really thinking about a watershed approach as we determine strategies moving forward is going to be really important. There are some strategies that will work out here in these parts of the region that still have a lot of wetlands and, and, and habitat and green space intact that may not work here in our urban core. But there are strategies that we can use in the urban core. And this is just a, a really small list. And we have tremendous experience or expertise in the region between urban planners, engineers, ecologists, and a whole host of, of other folks that can help to uh, increase uh, the, this, this and build out this list of strategies. In taking a watershed approach, what it's really important to recognize is that we're all connected. What happens upstream affects downstream and also taking into account cumulative impacts across uh, watersheds. Those of us that have worked on wetland issues for a number of years very often see projects where you have one acre of loss here, five acres here, 10 acres here. Those projects on their own don't constitute large amounts of loss. But when you put those together cumulatively, you can start to see large landscape level impacts across watersheds and across the region. So these photos here on this slide are actually from a community um, in, in the Houston-Galveston region um, that was built on the concept of designing with nature. Very often when we talk about designing with nature, we're called tree huggers um, and, and told that we're not making the business case for doing this. But this is a very successful community. Any shout outs for, for what this might be? The woodlands. That's the woodlands. And it was uh, designed back in the late 60s, early 70s by the developer George Mitchell, um, who founded the woodlands and, also and is also the founder of our organization. But as you can see from the photos, as, as, as early as the 1960s, we had an example of a community that used green space and principles of nature within the, the planning um, of, of this, uh, of this uh, municipality or, or of this township. And it's one of the most uh, successful uh, areas in, in the region in, in terms of, of economic, um, in, in economic strength and businesses and um, drawing new people uh, to the area. Actually, it, it's kind of fighting it, its own success right now. Um, but if we look at the woodlands as an example and how the woodlands did during Harvey, there, there weren't a lot of flooded homes in the woodlands. Um, some of the, the, the homes that did flood actually exist in some of the newer developments that are um, kind of straying a bit from some of those design principles that were um, espoused in, in the early formation of, of the township. But it's a great example of, of what we can do in the region. Financing uh, resilience. So we've, we've heard the numbers. Um, there are upwards of, of nearly $200 billion, $180 billion, um, in terms of Harvey costs, losses, and, and recovery. Um, the federal government is stretched to its limits in terms of having to deal with Harvey and Irma and Maria. And the speed with which our local government officials have to move to get some of those federal dollars coming into the region doesn't really give us time to think of um, kind of new and more creative resilient strategies. So how can we fund this going into the future? There are actually some novel approaches that are being used in other parts of the country. A couple of these on this list are being used here locally. Uh, property assessed clean energy, it's called PACE financing, is a way that commercial building owners are financing uh, the retrofit, retrofitting of their commercial properties uh, to bring in clean and renewable energy. There are are folks talking about how they can apply that type of financing to building um, resilient infrastructure on some of those properties. PACE is also used 
in some residential areas, not here in Houston, but in other places. Green bonds. Uh, we, green bonds, we actually had a form of a green bond when we passed the bond for Bayou Greenways in the, the Houston region uh, a few years ago. Uh, resilience bonds and environmental impact bonds. Those are two other types of bonds that are being used around the country um, in places like Louisiana, uh, where we're getting creative um, in terms of, of how to do um, financing for, for these types of projects. And to close out, how do we build the capacity in the region to really bring people together? So hearing John Branch talk about bringing people together in terms of, in the form of town hall meetings, connecting residents and communities with experts, whether they be hydrologists, ecologists, urban planners, engineers, architects, how can we create a system to do that moving forward? One of the things that's happening around the country and what we would like to see occur here in the region are the creation of resilience collaboratives. Um, there are a number of them on the West Coast, although we don't talk about that too much because no Texan likes to hear what California is doing and, and use that as a model. But they're also being created in places like Arizona, Michigan, uh, the Carolinas, Florida, places that are not so different from Houston and Texas in terms of political landscapes and, and business environments. And what they're about are bringing people together and bringing stakeholders together over the course of the long term and building information and uh, collaboration uh, infrastructures. And so when you have a resilience collaborative, what you have are people working continually, again, over the long term to identify what are the barriers to resilience, how can we overcome them, what are the uh, building information networks, how can we get data and science into the hands of decision makers and the public, uh, building a framework of, of resilient strategies. Um, so we've had a number of ideas tonight about whether it's changing our floodplain ordinances, whether it's retrofitting existing structures, whether it is preserving wetlands um, out in the outer reaches of the, the region and um, placing conservation easements on those properties. There are a whole host of strategies and we can build that into a toolbox and, and use technology assistance and, and other things to share that information across municipalities and across local governments. And that's how we build a community of practice uh, moving forward to truly become a resilient region and uh, what we would argue a, a sustainable region in the future. Thank you very much. All right, uh, we now uh, will have a question and answer uh, session for about 15 minutes. And uh, I already have a few questions up here that have been passed up to us, which I'll read off. We also have the opportunity for folks to come up and ask their own questions at the mic. Uh, and so I'll try to alternate depending on how many folks are up here. Uh, and what I'll do uh, is I'll address this to specific panelists but anyone's free to ans answer or interject or disagree. Uh, and so first thing though, it's an informational uh, question is, uh, will presentation slides be available on the website? Uh, we have been talking about, uh, we're recording all this and we are gonna try to host this on, on the EIH website and make it available to everyone. And depending on the, the wishes of the presenters here, we'll encourage them to also provide uh, PDF files of their, their presentation if they wish. And so the answer is generally yes. So um, the other questions I have here, and this is addressed to anyone, is, um, and, and the reason why it's addressed to anyone, because it's probably the most controversial question, uh, was there a failure of leadership at the county? Uh, where would, what would they have done differently in the last 10 years to have avoided this? And I'll open that up to anyone who cares to interject. I'll start. That's my sister agency. So uh, unfortunately, they're not here to represent themselves. So I'm, I'm not going to say whether or not there was a failure. Uh, it's easy to point, you know, play armchair quarterback on a Monday afternoon. Uh, but, the, you know, the issue is, uh, 
And, and what I've told everybody is, is that we're not looking back, we're looking forward, and, and, and that's really the approach that we have to take. Sure, did we underfund flood control on the local level, whether it's county or whether it's city? Yes, if you, if you think about it. And, and so, but what I, I have to remind everybody when we talk about floodplains and we talk about development, the National Flood Insurance Program started in the late 60s. The maps became available in draft form in the late 70s. The city and the county didn't adopt them until 1981. The minute the maps were adopted, 70% of the floodplain was already developed. Was already developed. And then since 1981, the maps have changed three or four times. So areas that were developed out of the floodplain all of a sudden became in the floodplain over those years. So it's not about whether or not development had occurred willy-nilly. It was the fact that the program was a new program. Development was already occurring. It already existed. Yeah, how are we learning? Do we need to adjust to what Harvey is, what John was talking about? Yes, it's a new day and that we need to think differently. And what are we going to do moving forward is really the question that we need to be asking ourselves. And I can't. He's not allowed to talk oh, after me yeah, anymore. I know. <laughs> I just couldn't pass it off, pass up uh, responding uh, to you. So I, I absolutely agree that we should be looking forward, not necessarily pointing fingers at individuals, but I think we ought to recognize that there was a general failure of planning. There was a general lack of vision uh, there. Uh, because clearly all of these decisions were, were bad decisions. Now, were they made intentionally? Were they made willfully? We can just leave that as, uh, you know, for future discussion. But one thing I, I think we should point out is that, yes, uh, the NFIP came in later, but I live in a neighborhood that's 100 years old. And that neighborhood, when they put it out there and platted it, they platted it based on the fact that it was convex. And so this is 1914. So, so people clearly, well before NFIP, well before FEMA, people understood the landscape and knew that there were some areas that flooded and, 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 and didn't flood. So, so now we're going to have this discussion yeah. because obviously oh, where oh. he lives is yeah. probably one of the highest parts of the city of Houston outside of the Heights. And But what people have to recognize is during the 50s and 60s and 70s as development was occurring, the way we look at the topo of the land was using a hand level to figure it out. Now we use LIDAR survey from the satellites. All right, so things have changed, technology has changed, and the way we do things have changed. And what most people don't or can't appreciate is that prior to 1984, we really didn't pay much attention to what happens when we had so much rain that it's got into the streets and where it went. Post-1984, we did. So if you go back and look at some of the, the flooding events that have occurred, most of them have occurred in the older neighborhoods that were built pre-1984. I'm not justifying where we are today, but what I am saying to you as a public official, that in my observation, what the government has done in the past is that it's always been reactive rather than proactive. And because of that, it's cost us 10 or 20 times. And what we need to think about now as a result of Harvey is to be proactive. And I think that's what the panelists here are suggesting to the audience, that we need to all work together it can't just be us advocating for a particular position. We need the community at large to talk to the people that make the decision, who have the pocketbook, who have the resources to give it to us to build these facilities. We need y'all's help. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to the next question. Thank you. Uh, this is a question I'll uh, address to Dr. Droxler. Uh, how do you attribute warming of the oceans between man uh, cause warming and sun or underwater volcanoes? <clears throat> the, uh, the effect of greenhouse, you know, are well understood. We have increased you no know, kind of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, you no know, kind of quite s tremendously. You know, we went you know, from uh, 280 parts per million to 410. And the physics of increasing greenhouse gases is and warming is well understood. So the warming you know, that we have created you know, through the emission of CO2, you know, this warming goes you know, in the atmosphere, but in, in large part you know, comes into the ocean and uh, is stored into the ocean for a long period of time. 
And it's interesting that now kind of this increase of sea surface temperature and the temperature of the ocean is just, it was just after a major El Nino event. So during some period of time, for instance, during the time between 2000 and about, you know, kind of 2010, when we couldn't see, you know, too much of an increase of temperature, is the time, you know, kind of when the ocean was storing this amount of energy. And during an El Nino, part of this energy is coming back and warms up the ocean much more effectively. And this, you know, kind of has been well shown in the few um, diagrams that I showed you, that kind of the ocean is taking this heat and returning it, you know, kind of to, to the system. And there's no doubt that uh, heat, you know, kind of of the ocean is the fuel, you know, of ba major storms. So the fact that, you know, kind of these storms have, have strengthening so fast, you know, kind of, for instance, Harvey, you know, kind of went in 36 hours from a tropical storm to a hurricane category four is almost not really ever observed before in the Western Gulf of Mexico. Regarding the volcanoes, yes, volcanoes, you know, would not, you know, kind of, you know, take into, you know, any, any large, you know, kind of increase of the, the temperature of the ocean. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the next question, um, I guess to uh, Dr. Uh, Jacobs or Mr. Casillo, uh, perhaps, or Mr. Branch, feel free to jump in. I live in Dickinson Bayou Watershed, and my neighborhood was built in the 60s. We got a foot of water in our house during Harvey. My home was never flooded before, even during uh, Allison. While I understand and appreciate a particular event was somewhat anomalous, I can't help but notice that in the past decade or two, there's been considerable development in the upstream portions of the Dickinson Bayou Watershed. I'd be interested in your thoughts on the impacts of this development on downstream communities and the feasibility of a moratorium on large-scale development in key areas of vulnerable watersheds. John? This John. But that was, oh, yeah. okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, oh, all right, okay. Um, well, no question that development impacts flooding, right? You have impervious surfaces, water can't get in, and it flows off. Uh, that holds true, well, it holds true for every storm, but it really, when you get something like Harvey, which at least we presently have never experienced, then in a sense it doesn't really matter what's developed and what's not. It's all going to run off and you're going to flood no matter where you are because it's just an overwhelming uh, system w without a doubt. And so that's why I stress, you know, it's those floodplains are the ones that we really need uh, to preserve. So moratorium on development well yeah i'd say yeah let's put one out there that's impossible of course but let's try to make the right decisions about where we ought to be f developing and and where we shouldn't be that wouldn't be a bad idea it's probably totally unfe infeasible but now, i got a follow-up question to that has there ever been a situation anywhere in the united states where citizens in a lower portion of watershed have if there's prior knowledge of that and would in fact increase the likelihood of flooding, have taken legal action. Anyone? We're saying we don't know. I, I have, in fact, I have read, uh, there might be, you need, need to have a lawyer here, uh, somebody, an environmental lawyer. I don't know, there's a guy over there who might know, but <laughs> I've at least read that there are some cases where people are suing upstream folks. I mean, we've got other kinds of suits going on here, obviously, so. Maybe for the next session. <laughs> okay, there you go. Panel. <laughs> yeah, all right. Okay, well, uh, one. Uh, hey, hey, oh, Chris Carr. Yeah. Just a follow up question to y'all's statement. Okay. Failure to call it prohibition on sensitive areas. We have land trusts in this area who try to preserve land okay. in sensitive areas. Okay. So, Bob Stokes with the Galveston Bay Foundation. And, you know, uh, this is Texas, so we're not going to prohibit people from developing places, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but if we had funding sources for acquisition like um, you know exploration green and other sensitive areas to prevent them from being developed in the future to create that green space um, that's what we can concentrate on so um, again you know that's that's an issue in Texas where Texas doesn't have a lot of any state funding really to speak of that helps conserve land uh, there are counties across Texas 
uh, Bear County in particular, that's been very proactive in raising county bond funding to help protect uh, important spaces like that. They, they do it to preserve uh, Edwards Aquifer spaces. We could very easily do it here to preserve open space and prevent downstream areas from flooding. And, and George, I, I would add that before we start talking about things like moratoriums, there are some gaps um, in, pre in protection that, that we can first start to address. So John and his team and my organization have partnered on a couple of studies where we've looked at the uh, federal no net loss of wetlands policy and how that plays out in, in the region. And what we found is that unlike other states that may have some levels of protection at the state level, um, once you get outside of the 100 year flood plain, the federal uh, regulatory process kind of falls off. And then the protection of those habitats that John talked about in terms of their water storage capacity, the protection of those types of, of habitats then fall to the local governments. And one of the things that, that happens in this region is depending upon how you slice it, we have eight to 10 or more county governments Within those counties, we have dozens of municipalities and each has their own sets of ordinances and everybody's kind of doing something a, a little bit differently. But what we found is that there is a gap in terms of existing protection um, of those types of, of habitats that can provide water storage. So before we start talking about development moratoriums, what we should be talking about is how can we uh, develop in a way where we're not paving over our water storage capacity with impervious surfaces, but how can we develop in such a way um, that we are incorporating the natural water storage capacity of the land? Thank you. Uh, this question is, uh, what? Do you have a question? Yeah, mine was right toward the line. I've been working with talking with uh, John Branch over the last three months. And I've come to learn that I've, I've come to learn that I've asked question, one specific question in spe specifically is that some of these drainage channels have existed for 50 years and there's no evidence that they have been desiltered or dredged in that 50 years, decreasing their water carrying capacity to Clear Creek or to uh, Horsepin Bayou or, or Clear Lake. And those decrease in volume uh, may result in added flooding into the homes. I've been flooded three times this century, twice in the last 28 months, once in 2015 and again in 2017. And uh, I've gotten comments to the fact that uh, they don't need dredging, but if you do a uh, downward shot from Google Earth, you can see the channel has definitely been deviated and not in a straight line, but go zigzag across the, just like was in one of the uh, drawings, they uh, showed uh, the water uh, shed or the uh, uh, floodplain where the channel in the center zigzag around, but the whole area was a floodplain. If you uh, go to several of the channels, uh, what they call channel J and K uh, uh, from uh, Texas 3 that runs along Pyramont through Brook Forest into Bay Forest and Bay Oaks, is that it's all silted up. And uh, Harris County has a statement, devise, implement, and maintain. Mm -hmm. And maintaining consists of mowing not maintaining the channel. The, do you have a, so if you just want to make a comment then, did you, well, a do you have a question? Or? Dredging those channels would probably go a long way in preventing a lot of flooding in the areas. Okay, thank you. Any comments from the panelists? All right, I have a question here that I'm directing toward, uh, speaking of dredging, uh, to Mr. Branch. Does the Corps of Engineers Clear Creek project still exist? And if it does, is there any activity or progress on the project? Okay, since none of our boundary um, is within um, Clear Creek itself, um, I really don't know uh, where they are on that. Um, anybody else? No, I don't no. know if there's anybody else. On well, I can add that it, it is on the Harris County Flood Control District's request for full funding from the federal government as a result of Harvey. Uh, the project is on hold, waiting for additional funding sources. That's that's all I know at the present time. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, let me see here. 
All right, this uh, question, well, let me see here. This question is uh, directed to Dr. Jacobs. Uh, there's been uh, discussion about building a third reservoir, leaving out the fact that Houston and Harris County have failed to conduct appropriate upkeep in our existing reservoirs. How is the restoration and protection of the Katy Prairie being considered by the city and county along with the maintenance of our current existing reservoirs? Well, my understanding, and uh, Mr. Costello can correct me if I'm wrong, is that third reservoir is really to shore up the the uh, other two reservoirs from you know downstream uh, flooding. I know that K KPC was uh, interested. The Katy Perry Conservancy was certainly in favor in a of a uh, smaller uh, levee or dike up in that area, uh, but they're not quite so happy with some of these larger dikes that might hold a lot more water for a lot longer time and not be so advantageous uh, ecologically. So that's what I know. I don't know if you know more. Well, just, just by the, uh, the question itself, I just want to make sure the audience is aware of the fact that the county nor the city has any role and in involvement in the operation of Addicts and Barker. And so that's primarily a federal government core facility. Uh, but what I do understand from visiting with our sister organization is that we are, they are requesting that the core do a 216 study of Addicts and Barker, which is really an assessment of the current operations and what, if in fact, any improvements can be done to reinstate those reservoirs to what their original design capacities were in, in the back in the 1940s. Uh, my understanding is that that study is pending congressional authorization of their budget for the next FY, which they'll know sometime next month. And I know that the flood control has actually offered to pay for half of that study to expedite the, the actual progress of the project. And in fact, I have the scope of work. I was reading it before I left my office this morning. Thank you. Um, I have one last question, and then we're going to have to move on. We are going to try to uh, answer a lot of these other questions. We're going to post them on the website eventually, and we're going to see if we can work with some of our panelists to address all your questions. Unfortunately, we run out of time. but. Uh, one of the uh, questions I had, last question I wanted to quickly ask is, while climate change contributed to the rainfall stall in the hurricane, we can't forget the rampant development was a major cause for the flooding. What is the future for our, our area in terms of development? And uh, I guess I'll direct this to, to Mr. Branch, but they also had a, a PS here, I learned how to water ski in Attic's Reservoir in the 1970s. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're trying to keep you from water skiing in, in uh, Horseman Bio by keeping it down a lot uh, lower. Um, but, you know, there's, you know, water districts have very narrow uh, authority uh, in Texas, not like a city, not like a, a county. Uh, we can't stop development. Um, we can't prevent things. We can't pass ordinances. Okay. All we can do is, is try to use good sense uh, in what we do. Uh, and that's why in 2005, uh, because of um, recommendations from hydrologists, uh, we increased the uh, stormwater detention requirement uh, in our area. And if you look at the, uh, the retreat, which is the newest subdivision uh, going in, um, those ponds uh, were built for one acre foot per acre. And if, that, uh, if they had not been put in, and they put them in first, thank goodness, um, then that water would have gone right down into um, Bay Oaks, Bay Forest, um, and um, uh, Brook Forest. And if you thought the water was high in the bio this time, if that water had, um, you know, been increased and not had those detention, it would have been a lot worse. And of course, as that rises, that, that floodplain goes out. So, um, you know, there are some things. Uh, that's one of the things that you can do is, is looking at, you know, how do you retain more uh, and use good sense in that and then stay firm. Uh, and yes, you know, there's always people trying to sue you. Um, and you got developers that want to sue, uh, saying it's not uh, reasonable, et cetera. Uh, and you just got to figure out what makes good common sense and then stick with it. And you just, you take the abuse that comes with it, uh, but you do what's right. change our panel. Uh, people can freeze and get up and down. Um, uh, I'd like to thank our first panel. They are, did a wonderful job. <laughs> and we learned a lot. And I also like to thank the audience members for their questions. Uh, and uh, 
you're free to get up and go to the restroom right now, whatever. We're going to be swapping out our panels now. And I ask that the second panel come up here and then we'll make a short, in a few minutes, make a short introduction.